Thank you very much. So the title of my presentation is rather long, but it's it's really a, it's about traditional uh, African vegetables uh, in home gardens for the for improved diets through increased consumption of these vegetables, but also for improved um, income generation. And it is based on a project and experiences from East Africa. So why focus on traditional African vegetables? In this table you see a comparison of um, two um, traditional vegetables with a common vegetable that everybody knows, white cabbage. And if you look at some of the nutrients, iron, zinc, calcium and vitamin, you see that traditional vegetables are way higher in terms of concentration per 100 grams dry matter. In terms of iron, these vegetables, uh, African nightshade and amaranth, have four times as much iron as cabbage, one and a half to four and a half times more zinc, three and a half to ten times more calcium, and seven to fourteen times more vitamin A. So really, if you want to improve nutrition through home gardens or vegetable production, um, you focus on traditional vegetables. So what was this project about? Uh, it was a home garden scaling project in three countries, Kenya, Ka Tanzania and Uganda. It was funded of, uh, through the Bureau of Food Security of USAID, implemented for two and a half to three years. And the goal was to reduce malnutrition for children under the age of five and women of childbearing age through the production of and consumption of vegetables. The project was located in um, eight different sites across uh, three different countries and all these um, so the unit was a county or a district or an island in case of Zanzibar and all these the locations are actually pretty different not only climatically but also culturally uh, we used we worked with lots of partners we had sub grants we had informal partners and seed companies these are some of the ones in Kenya we had a similar uh, range of partners in Tanzania and also in Uganda. And then we, before we started, we established a theory of change. And I would recommend that everyone does that before you start a project if you want to have a certain goal, particularly if it's a bit complicated. And in this theory of change, you start with the problems. And then, it lead, and then at the end you have the goal. The primary goal was to improve nutritional status of children, of children under five and women of childbearing age. But how do you get there? So we used three different approaches. First of all, gender awareness and uh, campaigns and training because there's such a big gender discrepancy. And when you talk about improving nutrition, it's really the, um, the, the primary role of women still in East Africa. It's important that you work with women and empower women. But we also use push and pull strategies. Push is to get the vegetables out there. How do you do that? Well, through making sure that people have access to seeds. Because as Aaron already said, some of the seeds you cannot buy in, in shops. So, but still, the, these seeds need to be plentifully available. People also need to know how to use those seeds. In other words, you have to train people on good practices of these range of these diverse different vegetables. So those are the push elements. At the same time, we also had a pull element. Now, what is a pull element? That is to create demand. Why should you eat those vegetables? People have eaten those vegetables since time memorials for centuries. They are traditional. The fact is that people eat very little of them. They eat about uh, 57 grams uh, average per capita per person, whereas the World Health Recom um, Organization recommends 400 grams of fresh uh, vegetables and fruits. So consumption is very low, but people would also need to understand what is, uh, what is hidden hunger, what is malnutrition. It's not about proteins anymore, it's about micronutrients. What are micronutrients? What are vitamins? Um, so the concept of nutrition, um, if you elaborate on that and educate that, it, cre it creates a demand. So a little bit more about these supply activities, uh, about the training, 
Um, you see in the picture here a demonstration plot. We use demonstration plots because that's kind of like a, um, a field laboratory where people experiment with the different vegetables. Some people are familiar with one, other people are familiar with others. They all have different agronomic practices. Um, some are leafy, some are fruit vegetables. Um, so lots of demonstration plots were established. We used the second column is about community-based trainers. Because we are working with so many different farmers, we had an intermediary um, uh, role for these people who are selected from the villages and would train other farmers. Uh, large numbers of farmers were uh, uh, being trained through this mechanism and uh, also large numbers of seed kits were distributed. Now these seed kits, you see a picture here, uh, these are bags with within the bags, pretty much like what you've received from, from ECHO. Within the bags, different types of vegetables, um, difficult to get vegetables. Initially, the World Vegetable Center would produce and distribute all these seed kits. Initially, they were free. However, we uh, started to um, transfer this responsibility to the private seed sector. In Kenya, we managed to 100% of the production and distribution of these seed kits were actually done through the private sector in the end. And we also introduced an, um, an, an, a mechanism of farmers paying for these seed kits uh, rather than receiving them for free. And that really enhances their ownership and their uh, dedication to the uh, activities. So these are some of the uh, seed companies that also in the other countries started to produce some of the seeds and some of the seeds we still had to produce ourselves. Uh, some of the training um, approaches and methodologies, you see here four pictures. Um, in the demonstration plots um, we talked about uh, sowing in lines, uh, easing um, uh, the weeding, um, raised seed beds, transplanting. You also see a bicycle there. The community-based trainers were given a bicycle to uh, move around. No salaries, but at least uh, facilitating their movements. Uh, you see, sorry, um, a seed trays, a, a great way of um, creating nurseries and tra uh, facilitating transplanting, but also saving of own seeds of op open pollinated varieties. Now, what are open pollinated varieties? These are varieties that you can plant and then you can harvest the seeds and then you plant those seeds again and you get exactly the same plant again. As opposed to hybrids, um, which you can plant, but you cannot harvest the seeds. You can, but if you plant those, then you get a different type of vegetable. So all the vegetables we work with are OPVs. What are the pool activities? This is, as you remember, is to, um, to enhance demand for vegetables, to enhance demand for the consumption of vegetables through increasing um, awareness and uh, accelerating behavior change. Um, here you, you see um, a, a picture of a, a field day. We had massive field days to when we started to um, enter new villages and uh, started to operate in new places. Uh, 200, 300 people attending those field days would not be an exception, would not be an, uh, unusual. Um, all raising the awareness about the importance of, of vegetable eating. Um, as part of that was also, also cooking demonstrations. And again, if the whole family starts to like these different uh, vegetables, but also different recipes, because some of the traditional ways of cooking actually uh, destroy nutrients or pour away nutrients. So we're also teaching and showing and letting people taste new uh, uh, vegetable uh, uh, variety, uh, recipes and ways of cooking. Um, also lots of discussion about gender, who does what, who gets to, who sells, who gets to uh, use the money, what do you use with the money if you get it, and radio programs. Uh, next, I'm talking about the, the use of the different species, the agricultural practices uh, that um, people use and that we've been teaching, and uh, seed production by farmers. So we did an extensive baseline as part of a randomized control trial. I will not bother you with, with, with that, but I'm showing you some 
uh, throughout this, uh, this presentation I'm showing you some uh, results of different experiments and surveys and studies that we did. So here you see uh, a range of uh, vegetables that people uh, were are using in the different countries. Um, anything that more than 5% of the respondents would uh, indicate. And you'll see that they are pretty much common across all the countries, but the intensity or the, the, the magnitude of that use is very different. In Kenya, for instance, 74% uh, 70, uses uh, kale or sukuma wiki. And similarly for cowpea leaves, kunde, ni African nightshade, mnavu or mnagu in Kenya, uh, very high compared to the other countries. Amaranth, pretty much across the board, very common. Uh, tomato, very big crop in, in Tanzania. So you see different regional differences of the of different um, uh, uh, vegetables and, and most of these are actually traditional vegetables. So what do people do with these vegetables? That's also important because as I said you need to uh, um, grow them properly to get the maximum benefit out of it. This is um, a slide and in, in the third year of the project where we looked at how many people adopt which kind of uh, agricultural practices and um, you see that 50% uh, of all the respondents, of all the participants in all the three countries use eight or more improved uh, agricultural practices starting from improved seeds, um, um, planting in line, transplanting, use of uh, compost, integrate, integrated pest management, etc. So pretty impressive. However, we also want to know, is, has there been a change from the baseline until um, the end? Uh, have, have our, has our theory of change and our strategies, has it actually had any impact? So just um, this, these are the results of the baseline and the end line survey. And I'm looking at um, the differences the, of the, 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 the differences between before and after. Um, what I'm highlighting here is uh, the use of animal manure, composting and mineral fertilizer. You see that in Kenya and Tanzania the application of animal manure and compost has increased significantly and at the same time the use of mineral fertilizer has decreased. Now that um, that's a good thing as long as you produce, uh, as you, you apply the, the, whole, the bottom line is that you do apply um, the um, nutrients, plant nutrients to your plots because especially if you harvest your vegetable in, vegetables in an intensive manner. And uh, really the biggest benefit of this phenomenon is that you actually cut costs because you produce your own uh, plant feed um, on the farm and you cut costs on the purchase of mineral fertilizer. A similar uh, phenomenon we, we see here with the use of, uh, um, of pesticides for pest and disease control, that reduced significantly and at the same time people inc started to increase the use of homemade or natural pesticides. Again, this is a very good thing um, because pesticides near your home compound with children running around through your a home garden, um, not all, people not always reading the instructions of the, of the very dangerous chemicals. Um, so using homemade and natural pesticides is, is good for, for health of consumers and people who grow them. And another one that I highlight here is crop rotation. And unfortunately you see that there was a significant decrease in the practice of crop rotation. Now, that's unfortunate, but it can also be explained. If you have a plot of 6 by 6 or 10 by 10 meters and you have seven different varieties and, and species and, and one species has a, a cycle of three to four months, it becomes incredibly uh, complicated to rotate. So it's not surprising that uh, people um, did not adhere to crop rotation practices. Okay, seed production, very important. Um, we did um, engage the private seed sector, but they don't have all the seeds. They also don't penetrate to all the villages. Um, so we looked at uh, how, what kind of seeds 
do people produce themselves and what's the quality of that seed because that was our major concern if we uh, focus on home seed production do people do we actually get a G -gen -G generation of the quality and one of the quality aspects a very important one is germination percentage so what you see from here is that the germination percentage is actually not that bad ranging from 25% to 70% on average. This was a study of 127 seed producers in Western Kenya. Not bad at all. This was much better than we expected. Also, a lot of variability. The other thing is that we see that nightshade, which is a difficult seed extraction process, it's a wet seed extraction process, the quality was actually quite good. Um, then we also looked at, so how do people get those seeds? Even seed producers, who, if you want to produce your own seed, you have to get your initial seeds from somewhere. And um, the last column shows that actually the majority of the seeds of all these different varieties were self-produced. So you, you produce your seeds with seeds that, are, that you have produced for generations. However, there's also other sources, agrovets, uh, shops, uh, gifts from others and purchase from neighbors. And you see that, again, it differs by, by species. African nightshade um, is the, the species in Western Kenya that is mostly purchased in shops, in agrovet shops. Why is that? Because it's, because it's such a laborious process to produce your own seeds. Gifts about amaranth. Amaranth is relatively easy in the prolific uh, cedar, so easy to give away. Uh, so you see all those nice differences. All right. Um, so um, the idea was that we would promote vegetables for increased consumption, but do people consume or do they sell the vegetables, or and uh, and do they buy vegetables? So what, what's, uh, how does that all fit together? So again, in the baseline, uh, we looked at um, what are the practices. So in the, uh, we did a recall of the past 30 days, and we found that across the three countries, uh, the, harvested, the average harvested amount of vegetables was 326 kilograms. Um, a little bit is lost, 8 kilograms in the process. Uh, home consumed, 44 uh, kilograms. Um, but sold 273 kilograms and people also purchase a, quite a significant amount from outside 121 kilograms so if we look a little bit from here we can see that selling and, the, and trade is actually very important even in home gardens uh, uh, production um, what you see in the picture is this is from uh, Machakos uh, County and uh, does anybody know what's in those bags? Who can guess? Who is from that part of, the, uh, of Kenya? <laughs> Nobody? Well, it's, it's cowpea leaves. These bags are filled with cowpea leaves. Every morning along the, uh, the, the, the tarmac, um, producers, uh, they come up with their, 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 uh, these, uh, these massive bags that they've started harvesting at 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, they are loaded up by pickup trucks and fetched to the Nairobi, to the wet markets, to the wholesale markets. It's a very big business. Um, so to conclude, um, more than 80% of all the vegetables grown was sold. Um, but there was also differences among countries. In Kenya, uh, the, the trade was actually much more developed than Tanzania, for instance. And Uganda was kind of in between. Okay, just another um, example uh, to show the, the, the dynamics of selling and consuming through a little case study from, uh, again from Kenya. This is uh, Mr. Munyao. Um, he was trained uh, in the program of, uh, on, seed, on vegetable production and, and, and he received the seed kits with the different species. He planted a, a garden of uh, 500 square meters uh, he participated in, in cooking demonstration and he got so excited that um, he made sure that now every meal at least one vegetable is being cooked. You see the remnants of uh, a greenhouse here 
and he actually started producing vegetable, uh, traditional vegetables in those plots that are uh, previously, where he probably previously grew tomatoes. Usually, these structures are used for tomatoes. Uh, got a decent income, 4,000 shillings from a uh, front cycle and um, he's teaching others now and he's even using his drip irrigation that he used for other commercial crops now for the, his traditional vegetables. Okay, so talked about a lot of things. I haven't really looked at gender yet. So what is there actually a difference, significant difference in how men and women are in this uh, business of uh, vegetable production and, 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 uh, and selling? What you see here is the number of hours that women and men and children uh, uh, spend on uh, vegetable gardens at home. And um, the boxes that I'm highlighting here, I'm just looking at Kenya again at the left. Um, if you look at those columns, the dark grey uh, is the, the number of hours, represents the number of hours of women, and the light grey the number of hours of men. And then the first column is for those plots that are meant for home consumption. And you see that in the first plot of uh, home consumption, women spend quite a number of hours per day, and, women, and, and men do a little bit. However, on the, the plots, the commercial plots, um, women increase a little bit of their um, uh, labor also, but men, even more, men are now very keen when it comes to selling. So that could be a bit tricky, right, if you move from home consumption plots to commercial plots. However, what we also see is that if we look at who sells those vegetables, it's the women. Right? 55 to 75 percent um, uh, of the cases, it's the women who sell those vegetables. And more interestingly, more encouragingly, is that women, most women, are allowed to keep the proceeds of the selling of the vegetables. So that's good news. We uh, also did a little case study on um, uh, women selling vegetables in, in Tanzania. Um, we looked at which type of vegetables do uh, women sell. Um, and it is across the board as uh, all the different vegetables that we are working on, the traditional vegetables, amaranth, jute, mallow, spider plant, etc. They all, they all have commercial value. Um, it was found that women acquire these business skills uh, through other crops. They've been selling maize and, uh, and, and chickpeas, uh, not chickpeas, pigeon peas in this uh, instance. Uh, however, they are, also, they are very much financially constrained. 95% said they had money problems, um, but they also solved them um, by themselves through joining um, Vicobas, village commercial banks. Um, there's also seasonal variability during the rainy season, business is good. Uh, sorry, during the dry season, business is good. During the rainy season, a very stiff competition. Uh, they are out competing each other. Uh, however, during the dry season, when there's a good demand for vegetables, water is the big challenge. And other challenges are theft, market information, where do you go with your vegetables to get the good prices, and support, lack of support from husband was also a major uh, constraint for these women. Okay, we'll look, also look now a little bit at the seed production. Is, does that have any gender dimensions? Um, well, we see that uh, men and women produce seeds uh, for themselves, but women, even though they are involved in commercial production, they give a higher priority. The main reason for producing their own seed is for home consumption, securing the home consumption. Male and female uh, farmers produce their own seeds. Unfortunately, there was, a, and this is, these are the results from Western Kenya, there was a marked difference in terms of how much uh, men and women earn. And uh, women, you, uh, the women earn $14 less from the same amount of seed production than, uh, than men. So still uh, some work to do there. And it's actually not only common in Africa, it's probably uh, all over the world a thing that we have to work on. 
um, and seed insecurity persisted. So there's a lot of seed production of different varieties, but still everybody perceives there's a lack of seed during, uh, for certain varieties and certain times. It's not available all the time everywhere. So seed companies, you still have a big role to play making these varieties available in the rural areas. All right, so summary of the lessons learned and conclusions. So home garden scaling in East Africa, it can increase the diversity of vegetables grown for home consumption and selling. We have seen that. And also the uh, adoption of good agricultural practices. So diversity is good, contributes to better nutrition and good agricultural practices make sure that your availability of vegetables increase. Measuring the impact of the project uh, activities on the dietary diversity is not easy. Um, not sure how many of you are aware with um, this indicator called dietary diversity score. We use that. Um, the tricky part is that we use the dietary diversity score of FAO which uh, considers 12 different food groups. However, all our, the traditional vegetables, they fall in the same group, in dark green leafy vegetables. And dietary diversity scores look at diversity, like does the diversity increase over time uh, due to some kind of intervention, but it doesn't look at the quantity of uh, what is produced or being cons uh, particularly what is being consumed of that, that particular group. So the diversity, unfortunately for us, because we couldn't demonstrate uh, then the impact, was very high already at the baseline. So they, people increased the consumption, but the, the score didn't significantly change. Households, however, were able to extend the period of availability of uh, vegetables, and that is good news um, because vegetables are very seasonal, uh, particularly in rural areas with water scarcity, um, but they were being able to significantly in increase the period of availability for 1.3 months. Um, more than 90% of the participating, participating households uh, mentioned that the quantity of vegetables consumed by children increased, that was the whole aim, and that the health of the household members had improved. Conclusion, so although the intended pathway was to improve nutritional status of women and children through increased production and home consumption of vegetables, this was only partially achieved in the intended pathway. So what is the other pathway? So our intended pathway was to increase uh, home production, increase availability, increase consumption. No, there was a lot of selling going on. And what we did not really measure was how much of that selling actually is being consumed by others or how much of the, the vegetables that, they, uh, that people buy from the the income that they uh, gained from selling vegetables is being, uh, uh, is being consumed. We did that a little bit, but we did not uh, study that as detailed as for the home, home consumption part. So, uh, in, in, so a, a significant amount of vegetables is actually um, uh, being bought, and that would also um, uh, potentially uh, increase and improve diets. Lastly, women business opportunities do exist. There are, there are, there are several, there are numerous in production in the, of vegetables, in production of seeds, but they, are, they have different constraints and in different places and in different ways. So really, if you want to um, work with women, improve their status, improve their role and, and, and their significance in improving uh, nutrition and income, you have to look at those constraints in the very different circumstances. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. I'm the judge from Australia, from Uganda. And I want to illustrate my question by an example. I've been a new seed collector for about 40 years, and I gave a uh, seed collection demonstration in a refugee camp two weeks ago. And if I do it right, wash them, whatever, dry them properly, I get everything right, time after time. If I take shortcuts, it doesn't work. They get moldy, fungus, and tough thing. So, 
how do people in your project areas learn how to uh, treat seed, how to dry and process seed, and do you or your team sometimes teach them? That's what I would like to know. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks very much for your um, for your question. Yes, we do teach uh, uh, farmers to produce seeds and community-based seed um, trainers to produce seeds. Um, there's, as I mentioned briefly, there's uh, there's dry methods and there's wet methods, like the the, the nightshade has a wet method, um, which can potentially be very tricky. Um, However, we see that people are actually quite good at it and um, uh, perhaps that's because these vegetables have been around for many centuries. Um, they're collected from the wild but they're also grown and people have, have developed those skills. And, uh, and we were also very much concerned about the quality, like the moles, just like you. But we, we have shown that in our study that um, the, 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 the quality of the seeds were actually quite uh, good. They are not at, of, according to international standards, which should be like between uh, 80 and 98% uh, germination percentage. Um, we also see that people do specialize. So not everyone is good at producing seeds. Um, there, uh, some people are more uh, specialized in producing certain seeds in other seeds and there's a lively trade and bartering of, of seeds and so there's a, there's a healthy uh, diversification and specialization going on in the villages. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you Dr. Rao Zaran. Okay. Um, in your lessons learned you mentioned that 90% of the households um, had an increased consumption of vegetables and that health improved. And I'm curious, how do you determine how the health was improved? Was there kind of a before and after, a checklist or something like that? Yeah. So I must say that was, uh, that was a survey question that was people's own perceptions. So we did not, uh, well we also measured that. Um, we actually didn't get very good presentable results on that, statistical results, um, but it's always also nice to have people's own perceptions on so those data were people's own perceptions. Okay, I wanted to know, I don't see that the perennial vegetables uh, feature here and I wonder if you can incorporate them because they seem to me important to avail high or dense nutrient uh, vegetables all through the season without much effort. And uh, the second que question is, uh, recently the UN made a declaration for small farmers, that I'm sure you must be aware, in November, which uh, uh, defends the right of farmers to produce, uh, share and sell seeds. However, some countries uh, here in East Africa have begun to restrict that right. Have you taken an advocacy role in this or do you, do you, has it affected your work? All right. Thanks for those questions. Yeah, um, yeah perennial species. Um, cassava was mentioned, although it's not probably um, um, semi-perennial. Um, in uh, Uganda, there's a significant, um, uh, I, I, if I remember from the top of the head, between 20 and 30 percent of households use cassava leaves. So, and cassava leaves are incredibly rich in vitamin A, very, very good uh, vegetable. Um, we did not uh, focus uh, too much on perennial species because our approach was we uh, would only spend a maximum one year in one village and then move to another village. So it, um, it just didn't fit in our um, operational plan. However, what we did recommend was using uh, Moringa trees as life fences. Um, and Moringa is, is, is a, a superfood, so there's probably nothing better than uh, Moringa uh, leaves. Um, what we've also started to embark upon is a, a collaboration with another center called ICRAF, a World Vegetable Center, um, because 
fruits and vegetables are actually to a large extent inter-exchangeable when it comes to um, health aspects and, 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 and making sure that you get enough micronutrients, vitamins and minerals in your diet. So um, we've actually, we are actually now looking at in those places where people harvest uh, or collect fruits from the wild or plant it, uh, how much nutrients do they get from those, uh, from those fruits during which months of the year and how can you now specifically target those nutrient gaps in the year in different places with specific vegetables because all these different traditional vegetables they have, they are, they have Gen they are generally good in nutrients, but some are very high in iron, some are very high in, in, in vitamin A, such as cassava leaves, which I just mentioned. So f uh, filling in those nutrient gaps with specific vegetables so that you can have a, a complementary and all-round uh, um, diet made up of fruits and vegetables. Um, the second question about uh, people's access and um, um, international or uh, yeah, open property of uh, access to the seeds, property rights of seeds, um, we always uh, stress that. Uh, so our uh, seeds, um, whoever gets uh, seed kits, okay, we we. Uh, we don't let farmers or individual recipients sign an SMTA and material transfer agreement, but uh, the districts or NGOs they do sign uh, something that um, uh, which which is a general declaration, international declaration designed by FAO that preserves the rights of those species that they are always accessible to everyone in the world. It's an international property, um, and that that is is very important and. In my opinion, there hasn't been any problems in, um, in the countries where we've worked in uh, East Africa where somebody claims that these are uh, vegetables belonging to, um, um, to a certain company. It is different for hybrids. Um, hybrids are, are actually uh, owned by uh, companies um, and, and I think that's their business model. If they are not owned by companies, they would, be, they would go bankrupt. Um, hybrids are superior in many ways in terms of disease resistance. Uh, it's also for in, sometimes good for the environment because you need uh, less pesticide. But uh, yeah, those seeds are those, um, yeah, those varieties are uh, are restricted. Um, but you can obviously uh, buy them. Um, all our varieties in World Vegetable Center are open pollinated and so they can be reproduced by anybody who gets uh, hold of them. So we allow one more question here, another one here, then we go there behind. I'm Maria Matias from Foresta, Tanzania. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. I want to get more experience from you on how do you go about controlling pests and disease? Right, yeah. So right in the beginning we had that dilemma. Do we um, promote the use of pesticides or not? And initially we also had um, seeds um, of tomato, courgette, zucchini, and uh, bell peppers in the seed kits. And uh, we found a pronounced, pronounced difference between those the global vegetables on the one hand, like tomatoes, zucchini, and uh, bell peppers, and the traditional ones. The tomatoes, zucchini, peppers were major, they had major problems with pests and diseases, and we had at that point not started to educate um, uh, on the use of pesticides. We also had a bit of a tricky situation, and there was a lot of debate uh, our, in, within our own organization and donor organization whether we should allow uh, whether we should actively train the use of um, chemical pesticides and we decided not to. Why not? Um, because if we're talking about home gardens these are plots next to the, the, uh, to the homes where children move in and, uh, in and out. Uh, we were randomly selecting beneficiaries because of a randomized control trial so in the very poor and mal malnourished affected areas where there's unfortunately high correlation with less education, illiteracy. So um, teaching, even if you teach the use of pesticides in a very good way, if people cannot read, the, the chances of misuse of these pesticides are, are enormous. And 
if your project working on improving health, then you actually you risk that you're actually um, creating a lot of uh, harm uh, in terms of uh, uh, yeah, health. Uh, so we decided not to. However, what did we do? We did then actively, uh, well, we removed the, the tomatoes, uh, courgettes and uh, bell peppers from the seed kits, put some other uh, traditional vegetables in it. Um, traditional vegetables are also affected by pests and diseases. Don't dream about that. These are, uh, these are resistant to everything. They are affected by mold, by powdery mildew, aphids, um, uh, spider mites, what have you. But there's a lot of ways that all these insects that I'm, I, and, and diseases that I've mentioned, they, you can address them. You can address them with soapy solutions. You can address them with extracts of Tithonia, Lantana camara, mix them a little bit, add a little bit of soap. So we have all these different methods that we have been actually actively been teaching. And this is where the method of community-based trainers comes in. So we called all these community-based trainers, gave them intense training on how to prepare these um, uh, different uh, natural um, um, uh, medicines, or natural pesticides. And uh, it does have an effect. You cannot control 100%. You also combine it with other IPM, integrated pest management practices, rotation to some extent, uh, catch crops, uh, repelling crops, uh, burning of refuse, uh, spraying water, great for, um, uh, for controlling spider mites. Um, it, 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 it's, it's the most effective way of controlling spider mites, just spraying water on top of the plants right? and, or, and uh, ideally also a little bit on, on the underside of the leaves instead of just on the floor. That, that, that get, gets rid of your spider mites. So there's a lot of ways that you can use um, um, uh, natural methods to control pests and diseases. I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, seasonality was one of the most prominent limiting factors there in, in people's ability to produce vegetables. I worked with a program, well a couple of programs for 10 years getting local farmers, smallholder farmers to develop different water systems, water management systems and uh, one of the most widely adopted uh, and it spread even to several other countries um, was using very, making very very simple water filters. Uh, they could filter the water being used in bathing, not, not from the uh, latrine, but, but from bathing, from washing dishes, from washing clothes, etc. They could filter it, get the soap out of it, and then use that for growing vegetables year-round. And uh, it, 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 uh, a lot of the women tripled and quadrupled their income from vegetable growing because the vegetables are more valuable during the dry season. Sure, no, exactly. I, I didn't focus on that. I think last year I uh, focused more on uh, climate and, uh, and, and water saving technologies. But that, you're, you're very right. Uh, water is, is the main constraint of actual production in the, in the, in the semi-arid areas uh, where, where we are working. Um, so recycling the use of uh, household water um, is, 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 a major, um, is a major opportunity to extend the vegetable production in the dry season. And uh, last year I also uh, showed you uh, the um, technologies such as keyhole gardens and uh, sack gardens, where you actually, instead of pouring your precious water on the ground and it just disappears in the ground, you actually pour your water in a medium that is contained and where you're actually increasing the chance of getting it to the roots of the plants rather than it to just disappear. I have appreciated your presentation so much. I'm Dela coming from Ghana. You made mention of cowpea leaf and uh, I want to know if there's a specific cowpea variety and the age which is being harvested as a, a lucrative business you have been talking of. Thank you. All right, the, the one that I remember um, is Vuli. It's, um, there's a lot of uh, cowpea varieties. We have, um, uh, there's a lot of varieties and accessions of uh, traditional vegetables. We have a collection of more than uh, 2,600 2, different accessions here only in Arusha. In, in Taiwan, we have more than 60,000. So 
I would also uh, encourage you to come to our uh, research station, by the way, on Friday for the excursion. Um, but Vuli is the one that uh, we selected. It's it's good. Uh, of, of, you know, cowpeas are obviously also used for uh, for seeds in in, mo in many other countries. The seed is the primary uh, product. In Nigeria, cowpea leaves are all, are um, are a triple purpose uh, because they are used for uh, animal feed. It's a major animal feed. But Vuli is uh, um, a, a crop that uh, you can harvest. You can um, uh, harvest repeatedly. So you cut, and then it re-sprouts, and it has a very good drought uh, tolerance. Thank you for the very exciting uh, presentation. My name is Lomayani from Tanzania. Um, when you were presenting, uh, you mentioned one of the challenges being that uh, women are more producing the vegetables and that, of course, they have the big intention is to uh, generate their income. And my question is, do you have an aspect of training, teaching them on the importance of consuming vegetables, knowing that uh, there are lots of uh, vitamins, as you mentioned, but it still it seems that they are selling more of the vegetables instead of consuming them. But again, the second question is about uh, incorporating uh, much um, into the planting of these uh, vegetables, knowing that East Africa is also faced with a big problem of drought, and that much would probably help in the conserving much of the uh, 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 of the water, around, instead of just runoff going on the, their fields. So these are the two, the two questions that I have. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks for your question. Um, Yes, the whole setup of the of the initiative was to, um, if you remember the, the pool elements, the creating of demand, um, that was through uh, awareness creation, and that so there was a lot of focus in the trainings on um, on the benefits of traditional vegetables, on the nutrients that are in it, on the. Um, uh, importance of feeding your children below the age of five uh, properly uh, because of the, when they are malnourished uh, they will not perform in the same way um, then they can never catch up after the years of uh, the age of five and they will not perform in the same way not grow physically in the same way as when they are properly uh, nourished um, uh, how to cook them, uh, how to, what, what a, um, a, a diverse diet is, because it's not only about uh, vegetables, it's like five food groups that you have to eat every day. So these elements, they were thoroughly, thoroughly trained. However, um, you need to give people their own freedom to, um, to do with the vegetables, what they, how they feel fit. Um, and there's always a need for, for cash. And, but I also believe if you have, uh, if you increase your home garden from let's say a 6 by 6 to uh, a 10 by 10 or a 20 by 20 piece of uh, land, then you're actually growing much more than you need for your, uh, for your family. So, and if you har harvest on every, any particular day, you get much more than you can consume. And I think that is good. And I think that extra income, you can then, if you, for instance, you, have, you harvest a, a lot of bags of cowpea leaves, you can use some of that money to buy okra or tomatoes or other vegetables. So I think we need to be not too hung up on focusing on home production and, and, and self uh, home consumption of um, uh, vegetables produced, but look at it more in a holistic way um, in, um, in, a, in a local um, market environment because these vegetables are mostly sold on the local markets and who are the people who buy these vegetables? Now, I'm not talking about uh, the, the cowpea leaves are going to Nairobi, but in uh, Babati and the Kitato districts where we work, all those vegetables that we've shown, they are sold on the local markets. And the people who buy them in these very local markets are local people who need those vegetables very much because they are in malnourished areas. Um, so that's the message I would want to, to give to you. Hello, 
good morning. My name is Christopher Kellner. I'm living here in Arusha. Uh, I want to come back to uh, pests and diseases. Uh, could you ex elaborate a little bit about preventive instead of curing methods? I'm thinking in particular on uh, feeding the, the plant properly. Yeah. And my second question is, uh, what I'm missing, I, lo I love to produce vegetables, what I'm missing is a calendar, uh, uh, what to do when best. I mean, in Europe this is relatively easy, you always have that because the climate is relatively unique, but then here, if you are in, in the uh, uh, Aromero district, a uh, coffee banana belt is different than if you go uh, uh, f 10 kilometers out. How do you how do you address this, or how do people uh, uh, dealing with vegetable uh, communicate a calendar? A calendar. You, you understand? My yeah, 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 yeah. I, I sure. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, uh, uh, the, the calendars um, they're a bit tricky. Basically, you can pretty much. Uh, um, crop all the, the vegetables all year round, but you get more uh, fungal problems in the rainy season and more the insect problems in, 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 the, in the dry season. Um, if you are very um, switched on, uh, then you can control those, all those diseases. If, if, but you have to, the trick is that whenever you see something happening, you have to immediately react. Vegetable growing, everybody can grow vegetables, but veg growing vegetables very well, not everybody can do that. That's what um, we always say. Um, yeah, and it starts with plant health. So uh, you, you're talking about preventive measures, so good soil fertility. It also starts with good seedlings, <coughs> with strong seedlings. If you grow seedlings uh, at, um, uh, which are healthy and do not have a disease, um, who um, are also not overgrown because sometimes, like for instance, uh, jute mallow, if it has, uh, if it's got more than five leaves, then uh, it starts to flower when you transplant it. So um, these things are, are, are the healthy seedlings are very important. Um, the plant, planting density, if you grow uh, okra, you plant it very densely, or tomatoes, if you plant it den densely, again you have problems of uh, powdery mildew. Um, other crops that you um, uh, that repel aphids, like marigolds, you also have uh, local marigolds that you can use to actually uh, repel um, aphids. So, so there's a lot of things that you can do before actually the, the, the pests and diseases start coming in. And as I said also with spider mite, just monitor it properly the moment you see it, remove the affected leaves, the burn them, uh, something, um, yeah, most inf infected plants you, you really need to, to burn um, and, and yeah, so many things you can do. I am Marengo P. Marengo from Floresta, Tanzania. I have two questions. One question, there is, there is a place where you just talk about market, but on market there, you just inform us that a lot of beneficiaries, they are just selling the product. So I would like to, to, to hear how, I would like you to share with us, so you as an as organization, which way or method are you using so that those products, that they are just being, they're just being sold. Because we know that the market to most of our beneficiaries, which is a challenge. Second, there is... Sorry, can you repeat that question? I'm not sure that I completely got it. Speak up a bit, speak up a bit. Okay. The question was... This way louder. Thank you. My question is, there is a press, there is, there is one of the slides, there, you have just informed us. You, you have just informed us about market. That most most beneficiaries are just selling those products. But to that slide, you have not informed us that how or which method are you using so that most of the product they are just being sold as an organization. Second question: There's a press you say that comparing Kenya, Kenya and Tanzania. In Kenya, they are just selling more than twice 
So I would like to hear that because of that challenge in Tanzania, how have you just tried to solve it? Thank you. All right. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for your um, uh, question. Um, yeah, you rightly noted that um, there's there's a lot of business going on, but your question is how do we how do we um, teach people to become better in that business? <laughs> That uh, was not the, the main purpose of this initiative because we, and I think if we had to do it again, we would probably modify it. But initially, we were focusing on home consumption through this model, this uh, impact pathway of increasing vegetables through the home gardens, home consumption, increased um, better nutritional status. And the, the, there was also, there's also a bit of, let me go to that impact pathway. Um, that there is a bit, uh, we, we had increased income there, but it was to, um, to facilitate the purchase of seeds because we envisaged that that was going to be a big bottleneck and we needed the private sector in there. Um, at some point uh, we um, did ask our implementing partners who were very good. Some, a lot of um, development partners are very good in value chain approaches and we recognize that um, at some, uh, and we modified our approach at some point and we, um, in all the countries there was some uh, training of groups on business approaches. The, the other problem or problem that, that was that the design of this intervention is that we were moving on uh, from one district to another district and would only spend one year in a certain place. If you really want to develop a good value chain and you want to build business skills, uh, you, um, you want to improve collective action in terms of uh, staggered production, um, uh, um, coordinated production, coordinated selling, um, business negotiations, to, build, to develop all that capacity from scratch you need more than one year. So I would advise if you do this again, really think about uh, business uh, skills, all these elements that I've mentioned, um, staggered production, collective action in the production, collective action in the um, uh, assembling of the produce, collective action in the selling, having committees, um, having teaching business skills, um, focusing on group dynamics because then money is involved in groups then you get again a different type of dynamic focusing on gender issues because when there's money involved men are much more become much more interested so really really very important um, for home gardens business of tra traditional vegetables to focus on that if you if you do it again your second question was, was that answered or not There's some questions in the back. Maybe the last one. The last one. My name is Ayesiga Abubel from Island of Peace, Tanzania. I just wanted to know if you are doing anything or you have done any study on post-harvest laws or post-harvest handling and management especially on the vegetables and what are your lessons and the advice to us organizations who are doing small gardens to to smallholder farmers thank you um, yeah thanks for that question that that's actually uh, one of the solutions to address the availability and the, uh, or the seasonality of the vegetable production and um, in other projects, we do focus on that. So if you come to our station, you'll see that we have different types of drying technologies of, uh, a, a different, for different uh, type of systems. Obviously, some are more expensive than others, and some are more sophisticated. Um, but drying of vegetables, including all these that we talked about, the traditional vegetables, is a very good way of preserving them and making them available in the dry season. And there's also a lot of cultural aspects uh, to that. 
uh, in northern Tanzania or Russia Arumeru, people hardly dry vegetables because there are just too much uh, rain uh, available here. But in Singida and, um, and uh, the Doma regions, that is a very um, big um, uh, practice of drying vegetables. So we did a study and found that there's a lot of use, consumption and also trade in uh, dried vegetables. <coughs> what needs to improve there is the hygienic circumstances because these vegetables are dried on the ground, sometimes on plain sand uh, without any canvas or anything but they're also exposed to uh, direct sunlight and ultraviolet radiation destroys vitamins such as vitamin A. So there's a lot to improve there, um, but I would recommend that you again do that in a business setting because uh, people drying vegetables for themselves, uh, if you want to do it in a proper way, hygienic and a healthy way, you need to invest in improved drying technology. It's a minimum of $100 and a, a poor family, the, peop the people we, the households we work with, they will not invest in $100 to dry technologies. So it has to be done in a group setting, in the, with a kind of like a business mentality, uh, and then you can go from very small entrepreneurs to as, as big as you want. Um, but I, I, would, I would say that would be the way forward. Thank you so much.